Hi guys, Mr. Palmer here with another talk about AP Chemistry. Today's topic I'm going to talk about is photoelectron spectroscopy, PES. So this is something we didn't really cover during the school year. Um, it's pretty simple and you're probably going to run into maybe one or two questions on the AP exam that involve this. So let's talk about what's going on with this. And I'm going to and make this a little bit bigger if you look at what is electron photoelectron spectroscopy well in this process what you're trying to do is figure out what's going on with inner electrons in an atom that is we want to look at the core electrons in an atom so we did things like we looked at um, you know ionization energy to see what happens with the outer electrons how much energy is required to remove one but what we're doing in electron spectroscopy is there's going to be a sample. Well, what's that sample? It's going to be some element. That's right here. So some element, and that element is going to be bombarded with x-rays. So when the x-rays hit that sample, it's going to knock the electrons out of an atom. And those electrons are then going to be sent along here. They're going to be bent around this voltage here. We have a positive and a negative voltage. So it's going to be obviously attracted to the positive, repelled by the negative. And then there's a multiplier on the other side that's going to measure how many electrons are coming out. And you're going to get a spectrum that's down here. So this is what would be printed out. Now this can be done with x-rays. You could also do this with ultraviolet light. Instead of being called XPS, ultraviolet light is called UPS. And you get something that looks like this over here. Now this is a fairly complicated one. Let me clear our annotations. And this would be a mixture of different elements. But what you're going to see is a series of peaks. And along the bottom, you see something that says binding energy. Binding energy right here. That's the amount of energy for that particular electron. And then on the side, the y-axis, you're going to see counts. So that would be how many electrons. So the height of that is the number of electrons that are in that particular energy level and the binding energy is how much energy that is. So let's take a look at two separate graphs. I made one for hydrogen and one for helium. So what would these look like? So what we're going to look at is what's called a simplified one. So a simplified PES graph and this is simplified right over here, right? There's not so much noise. So what you're going to see is just the peaks. You're not going to see a bunch of other stuff. So for hydrogen, you're just going to see one peak. So why are you just seeing one peak for hydrogen? The reason you're going to see one peak is that hydrogen only has one type of electron. So right here, hydrogen has a 1s electron, right? Hydrogen is 1s1 for its electron configuration. You're going to see that this hydrogen has a particular height, this peak, that tells us the relative number of electrons that are in that particular energy level. And there's going to be an energy. This happens to be an energy of 1.31 megajoules per mole. Right? So that's just the measurement of the binding energy. If we compare that to something like helium, we look down here at the bottom graph. So this is helium here. You're going to see two things about it. The peak is higher energy. 2.37 and it's also a higher peak so that the peak is over here and there's no number over here it just says relative number of electrons so what you're going to notice that it's about twice as many electrons twice as many electrons as hydrogen because the peak is two times higher and it has more energy we're talking about 2.37 compared to 1.31 megajoules so why is that and if you look at the Bohr model, right? This was helium's Bohr model over here. You see there is two electrons and there are two protons in the nucleus. So helium is going to have a higher nuclear charge than hydrogen and therefore it's going to be greater binding energy for those electrons. That's would be our expectation. So Let's say we look at a bunch of them. So here's a graph that shows you a whole bunch of different elements and it really just compares, right? I'm gonna draw a line across this one. So if you imagine 
this was the line across the bottom of our graph at zero. This would be our line across at zero. Here would be a line across at zero here for lithium. What you see is that now we have the peaks, but we have like more than one peak. So for hydrogen, this is the same one we had here. Hydrogen was 1s1. Helium, we showed, was 1s2. Those are the ones we just did on the previous graph. And I'll pop back to this one, and we see this was my graph. If I come back here, we're going to see that this one is higher, if you take from here to the top, compared to hydrogen, right? It's twice as big. So same graph. If we look at lithium now, lithium has two different things. Lithium, which is going to be this one right here, has 1s2, just like helium does. But it also has a secondary peak. And this is going to be from the 2s, and it's 2s1. It's a different energy, obviously. And it's smaller because there's only one electron in it, because the electron configuration is 1s2, 2s1. So beryllium, again, 2s2, I'm sorry, 1s2, right? It's 1s, even greater energy. It's up to 11.5. And 2s2, right? It now has two electrons. And you'll see that these peaks are the same height, the peak here and the peak here, because there's the same number of electrons in s-type sublevels. So when we get to boron, that you can guess. This is going to be 1s2. We're going to have 2s2 for the second peak. And now it's got a third. And we know what comes next. After 2s2, that's going to be 2p1. And it's got a one electron in the 2p. So we can keep going with higher and higher elements. What are they going to look like? We can get to carbon. So I'm going to draw a line across for carbon. Right, this would be the bottom of the graph. This would be like zero, bottom of the graph for zero. We'll draw our line. And so what's our electron configuration here? Obviously carbon is one S two. S two. Right? Two S two. And it's gonna be two. Two. It's got a two electrons in each one of those sublevels. You'll see they're all the same height. When we shift to oxygen, now we see oxygen. Let's do its electron configuration. 1s2, 2s2. And, well, what does oxygen? Oxygen has eight electrons, right? So it's going to be four in the 2p, 2p4. Neon, and we can do that one. Let me switch colors over here. Neon's going to be 1s2. It's going to be 2s2, 2p6. And really important, what do we notice? This peak is about three times higher than the peak before it, because there's going to be six electrons. The six electrons means that peak is going to be higher because this is the relative number of electrons on the y axis. So let's take a peek at neon and sodium. You'll see this actually has them already written on there. And you'll see sodium goes out here and it's going to have 3s1, right? So you see that it's going to have half the height of these other ones. The 1s has two electrons, the 3s has two electrons, the 2p has six electrons, and the 1s only has one, so there's sodium. Okay? So what do you what is this going to look like for you on a test? Here's a sample problem. So let's say someone gave us this as a photoelectron spectrum. So you, this is what you're given. It's probably going to look something like this. This is the simplified version. And we're going to look at it, and it says which element would have the photoelectron spectrum above. So let's take a peek at it. My suggestion for doing a problem like this is to go through and let's just identify what those electrons would be. 
So it looks like I've got a bunch of peaks here. These are the same height, right? I've got these tall peaks up here. I've got two of them. And I've got this little short one, right? So I'm going to guess that this must be starting at the 1S, right? So that would be 1S2. What would come next would be 2S2, 2P6. This would be 3S2, 3P6. And then this is going to be 4S1. So if we go to our periodic table, which element is going to have this electron configuration? And I hope you can guess that it's going to be potassium. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. So we're, that's what we're figuring out. Important thing to look at is what's the height of this peak over here, this last one. You notice that it's half the height of these other ones that had two electrons, so it's only going to have one electron. That's what's going to make it be potassium and not calcium, right? It's not calcium because there's only one electron. That one's half the height. So let's take a look at this one. I'll give you a second to read through the question, or I'll read it. Why does the binding energy for 1s electron in oxygen differ from the 1s electron in carbon? You'll see in this case, they're both on the same graph. All right, so what do we notice here? We're noticing that the oxygen has a higher binding energy for its 1s electron. Important idea. Oxygen over here has a higher number. So we're going to pick one of these choices. Choice A, oxygen has a higher number of valence electrons than carbon. B, oxygen has a double occupied orbitals. OK, maybe that means something. Oxygen has a higher nuclear charge than carbon. And then oxygen has a greater shielding from its 2p electrons. Well, this is a 1s electron. So shielding is not going to come into play here. There's not going to be any shielding of the 1s electron. So the thing that made the difference that we talked about was the higher nuclear charge. Hopefully, if you see this one, you're going to pick choice C. So those are just two example problems. This could be an open-ended problem, but I would suggest that um, more than likely you're going to run into this in the multiple choice. So if you want to look into your book for some more practice ones, um, I would certainly do that. I know that there's a few in there, and I'll see you next time.